finished, one of his disciples said, Master, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So he, Jesus, said, when you pray, say, Father, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. Then he said, imagine what would happen if you went to a friend in the middle of the night and said, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. An old friend traveling through just showed up and I don't have a thing on hand. The friend answers from his bed, don't bother me. The door's locked. My children are all down for the night. I can't get up to give you anything. But let me tell you, even if he won't get up because he's a friend, if you stand your ground knocking and waking all the neighbors, he'll finally get up and get you whatever you need. Here's what I'm saying. Ask and you'll get. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will open. That is the word of the Lord. I am going to read now from a different translation because it has some wording that will be important to my message uh, today. It is from <clears throat> the same passages from the New Revised Standard Version, starting with the 11th verse. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asked for a fish, you would give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asked for an egg, you would give them a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Pray with me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Send your word, dear Lord, send your word. Use this, your servant, this hour. May I preach with Holy Ghost power, fix our minds, our hearts, and our souls to receive your word. In the name of the one who died that we might live. Amen. This is not what I ask for. I have several grandchildren, and all of them are very smart and precocious, well-spoken, and uh, opinionated and brave. One day, I was, I'm not going to identify uh, uh, any one of them because a few of them might be uh, looking, uh, looking in, and so uh, I won't have to deal with that at another uh, point. Um, but one of them, when they were smaller, uh, I was uh, babysitting her, and um, there are several hers and several hymns, so no giveaways yet. Um, and uh, I was preparing dinner, and she was like, Papa, I'm hungry, I want something. And she was very specific about what she uh, wants to uh, eat, as she is specific about quite a few things. And so I said, okay, that's uh, fine. I enjoy cooking and so forth. So I prepared uh, up some stuff, and I thought that it would be better if, in addition to what she asked for, I would add a few uh, additional uh, things that would provide greater nutrition and balance and fiber and all of those things. Uh, I'm doing my best in the kitchen. I played it wonderfully. Presentation uh, is marvelous and bring it uh, to her. And she looks at it and says, Pop, Papa, that is not what I asked for. <laughs> like, okay. Uh, I won't tell you how the whole rest of the thing uh, went, but was uh, interesting and very appropriate for um, 
the sermon and the word of the Lord uh, today. That is not what I ask for. Prayer is important. Jesus did it often. We know that as evidenced by Luke's record of Jesus' prayer life. Nine different episodes Luke uh, records, and as such, he more than any other evangelist demonstrates the importance of prayer in Jesus' life and ministry. Prayer is also somewhat elusive and apparently uh, uh, can be and must be taught, evidenced by the fact that the disciple here asks Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. So prayer is something that can and should be taught. It is not something that there is a natural instinct, perhaps, uh, and desire for it, but the skill and uh, protocol is not necessarily self-evident. Uh, so the question comes, Lord, teach us. The request comes, Lord, teach us to pray. Fear, pain, and desperation are often the first teachers and incentives for prayer. But somehow it seems that in their observation of Jesus, they could detect that there was something other than fear, desperation, and anguish and pain that drove Jesus to these deep sessions of uh, prayer and for him to come away with his shoulders back a little bit more, his head a little bit higher, his vision a little bit sharper, his words a little bit more crisp and poignant. They wanted to know some of that. And so Jesus uh, taught them. Now there are two versions of what we now know as the Lord's Prayer. One of them is in Matthew chapter six, and the other one is here in the 11th chapter of Luke's record of uh, the gospel. Uh, they are similar in ways and they are different uh, in other ways. Both of them uh, suggest a certain uh, intimacy and familiarity and invitation to a relationship by calling uh, God Father. Matthew uses the Greek word for father, pater. Um, Luke uses the Aramaic term, Abba, which is a little more close and a little more personal, uh, Daddy. Both of them uh, allude to the, uh, uh, a bit of the, the transcendent uh, nature of God. Matthew, a bit more than uh, Luke does, Matthew uh, says, Our Father who art in heaven. Luke doesn't mention uh, heaven in his uh, description. Uh, Matthew is a tad more ceremonial, and again, it's a more high, Christo a more high uh, ecclesiology, uh, shall, shall we say, and a little bit more uh, lengthy. Luke is a little more short. He alludes to the authority of the father figure in uh, their uh, culture, and in Luke's uh, version, after he pays attention to some of the uh, uh, transcendent and sovereign aspects of uh, God and the glorification uh, of God, both of them, again, talk about the holiness and uh, special character and nature of God's name, hallowed be thy name, that comes from the root word of, of saint and sanctification. Your name is different, your name is revered, your name is uh, special. Both of them allude to the coming of the kingdom. It really says, let your kingdom be revealed Show us the rest of your kingdom. Yes, there is a bit of it in the presence of Jesus, but there is more to come. May it be revealed uh, to us. But in Luke's uh, version, he goes and makes a very swift, abrupt, and almost rude jump from the glorification and a what we call theocentric focus, theo, God, centric, centered on God. These are God's needs. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And then gets to the chase real quick. Gimme. 
give us this day our daily bread. I've got some needs. Give me some bread. Seems minor and very mundane by comparison, but that is precisely Luke's point, that we are invited to approach this God, this daddy, in all things and trust in God's mercies every day, every morning, morning by morning, new mercies I see for even the smallest of needs. God knows our needs, but nonetheless, we are allowed and invited to ask God to fulfill our needs. This prayer recognizes that we do need essentials of everyday life, but only enough of them, not excess. Give us this day, this day, our daily bread, enough to make it for uh, today because we know that there is an open door that we can come into tomorrow and we know of your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. And we know that tomorrow morning we will see a new mercy. But then he goes on, forgive, forgive us. We are guilty. We are guilty of having done, fallen a little bit short of our best behavior sometimes. Uh, gave a, a sharp word or a piercing glance to that one over there. Who, um, you know what I'm talking about. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive others. There is a little bit of the uh, uh, suggestion that in the uh, Matthew version that we can't be forgiven by God unless we forgive uh, others. That's not the, a complete and accurate version of that. It is not because God will not forgive us our sins unless we release others from their sins or debt to us, but because we hope to model God's love and God's mercy to us, we intend to and desire to model that same forgiveness and mercy to others because we have received that, we want to give that. So we're asking for God to empower us to forgive because we know of forgiveness. Forgiving others allows us to free ourselves to experience God's love more fully, which makes us be able to love even more. And then Luke's prayer says, now lead us, deliver us. Luke's got a lot of imperative commands here. You know, God, give me. <laughs> Forgive give me, I'm in need. Forgive me, I'm guilty. And now lead and deliver us. We are vulnerable and I am afraid. Lead and deliver us. Protect us from temptation that will cripple or destroy the soul. So our reading normally is deliver us from uh, evil. It is from evil that will destroy us. Protect us from that because we are vulnerable uh, to that. And sometimes, you know, it feels good to walk on the dark side. Keep us from that. Protect us from ourselves, as it were. Luke follows this brief prayer with two sharp, sharp teachings, short and sharp teachings that uh, intend to drive this point home. The first one is about a friend at midnight, who comes in the middle of the night, knocking on the door, knocking on the door, knocking on the door, waking up the household next door, saying, I need some bread. I've got a friend who has come into town, and I have nothing uh, available. The friend, as many of us might say, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> It's one o'clock in the morning. Kitchen's clean. All the stuff is up. Children are asleep. Not about to uh, do that. 
but keep knocking, keep knocking, keep knocking, keep knocking. And the text says that uh, because of your persistence, that friend will give you what you want. Well, there's a little bit more to know uh, about this. In ancient culture, hospitality was of paramount importance. If someone came to you in need, it was obligatory that you would be hospitable to them, that you would host them, even at midnight, even unexpected like the cousin or family member that shows up and calls on the phone, hey, John, we're in town, uh, we're coming by, when? Oh, we're about, about 20 minutes away. You're like, okay, thanks for sharing. <laughs> Very good. So when this person finds th themselves without bread for their guest and they go next door, there is something more than a loaf of bread at stake. It is the dignity and the honor of the person in need themselves. And the person, the sleep neighbor, it is incumbent upon them to get up to help to maintain the dignity and the honor and the wholeness of the person in need. And so the knock at the door is as much about arousing the humanity and the obligation of the one who is asleep as it is about the need of the one who is without bread and expecting a guest. The expected answer, the way that this question is set up, the expectation of the answer is, is that no, because uh, the way it's set up, it says, can you imagine if you had a friend and you went there and they would say no? Well, the answer is no, I can't imagine that. That would be horrible. That would be something that is totally and completely unheard of. And Luke's point is that if that's the case and you wouldn't expect even a dead sleep neighbor to refuse your request because they are obligated, think about how much more God is willing to answer your request, not out of obligation, not out of duty, not out of custom, because God loves you. How much more could you expect of God? In case the point doesn't totally and completely get through, he further goes on and says, well, how many of you would, if your child came and asked you for whatever it is, an egg, you would give them a snake, or you, they ask you for one thing and you would give them uh, another. If my grandchild was here, they would say, well, he would. Because uh, uh, I asked him for X and he gave me Y. Uh, but that was because I knew of her need and how much more she needed beyond what she even knew to ask. Only for her good and I'll let it be known now, she did go ahead and consume it, and she said, you know, after all, that actually wasn't too bad. What was that? And I was like, well, now, uh, as sometimes they say, if I tell you, I have to kill you. <laughs> no, you cannot, you cannot know that. Uh, that secret, uh, that secret stuff, that CIA recipe. So no, I cannot uh, tell you. Now the key to understanding all of this lies in some unpacking of the word persistence. Persistence is better interpreted shameless, not persistence because with the idea of persistence, it means that if we just bug God enough, we just keep knocking enough, then 
God, we can wear God down and God will relent to whatever it is that we ask. And that's not the case and that's not what Jesus is saying here. God is determined to help, help us live up to the honor and the dignity of who we are as people. God is determined to help us to utilize the gifts that we have been entrusted with. God is determined to give us the daily bread that we need. And God promises through Jesus that if you ask, you will receive. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be opened. And so there is the implication that we will get what we ask for. But that is not exactly what Jesus says. And for that reason, this is perhaps the most difficult part of the passage to preach because our own experience contradicts Jesus' words often. Many times we have asked and not received. We have searched and some of us are still looking. In spite of our most fervent prayers for the safety and health of loved ones, some of them have been lost to disease, senseless accidents, bad habits. In spite of the fervent prayers for people around the world, daily we hear of tragedies of violence, hunger, disease, and natural disasters. If God is like a loving parent who desires to give what is good and life-giving, why do so many prayers seem to go unanswered? Well, there is not a simple answer to this question, though sometimes simple answers are given. One answer is that it only seems that God has not answered our prayers. God always answers prayers. You just don't know what the answer is. Well, if the answer isn't known, is it really an answer? That's sort of like the one if the tree falls in the woods. You know the rest. Uh, not quite so sure. So sometimes we pray and we end up saying, hmm, this is not what I asked for. But Jesus makes that second point in that second story. But how much more, how much more does God give than you could possibly? But you know that, that expression, how much more, in different contexts has very different meanings. How much more can be as mundane as clarifying a monetary uh, transaction. How much more do I need to get all of my bills paid uh, on time? Uh, how much more time is there left to uh, complete uh, a task? Or how much more time is there left to this sermon that you're doing here? Yet, depending upon the occasion, how much more can either be a question that wishes for the end to come quickly, or how much more can hope that time will stop and stand still and prolong the experience and the moment. In the context of our personal lives, how much more might be, how much more can I keep up with the demands of my family? How much more of this strained relationship can I take? How much more loss can I survive? In the context of our professional lives, how much more will this job take from me? I can't take it anymore. How much more can I give before I simply lose it? How much more can I trust in God's word before in the midst of the hate and violence and hopelessness and anger and pettiness that I encounter in the world that the gospel starts sounding just like a figment of my imagination. 
And when we speak of our world, how much more can we hear about the manifestations of racism, terrorism, homophobia, xenophobia, before we believe dystopia is the norm as opposed to the kingdom of God. And so, sisters and brothers, we need these words from Jesus today in a special way, words that help us remember a context, a context we should never forget when it comes to making meaning in our lives. That is, how much more in the context of God, so that whenever we say how much more from our places of hurt and pain and loss, God's response is, how much more will I give you? Whenever we give voice to how much more from our locations of abandonment and rejection, God says, how much more do I promise to be with you? You are not alone. You are not abandoned. You are not rejected by me. Whenever we utter how much more from our spaces of disillusion and disappointment, God says, how much more do I love you? On the day that we call out how much more, God answers us, increasing our strength. Because for every how much more we say and we pray out of our anguish and our need and our fear and our pain, which we need to say, which we have to say, we cannot help but pray in our times of need and grief and longing. God responds with God's how much more. How much more friendship do you need? How much more love do you need? How much more time do you need? How much more peace do you need? How much more do you need to move from sight to insight? How much more do you need to move from knowing to understanding? How much more do you need to go from tolerating to embracing and appreciating. Whatever it is, it might not be what you ask for, but it usually is what you need, what we need, because you see, the point of prayer is not to change God's mind, but to shape ours, to make us fit for the kingdom. Prayer means that in some unique way, we believe we're invited into a relationship with someone who hears us when we speak even in silence. Prayer is our sometimes real selves trying to communicate with the real one, God, the truth with the light. It is us reaching out shamelessly, shamelessly, out of fear, out of guilt, out of whatever it is, shamelessly trying to be heard, hoping to be found by a warm and marvelous light from the cold darkness we find so prominent in the world. Some wonder how we should uh, pray. There is all kinds of books on prayer and you know, face the east and 45 degree angle with your head this way and so forth uh, and, and so on. Uh, and repeat after me and say it again and say it alto and bass and tenor and soprano uh, or whatever uh, kinds of uh, ways. Did you like that? Uh, was that soprano or a little, little bit off? Yeah, you could. Okay, I got potential. All right, <laughs> let's try that next time. But uh, in prayer, we just come to God as we are, not always saying the same things over and over. You do not have to speak louder. You do not have to tense up and shut your high eyes so tight that you start getting a headache. Because in the end, God knows what is best for us, not necessarily what we're asking for, not necessarily what we ask for, but much more than what we had. Ask, seek, knock, and it will open. P prayer is not primarily about getting things from God, but rather about the relationship that we have with God. Sometimes we go to God, and it might be 
uh, a financial situation or thing that we need, but instead, and read that text very carefully uh, where Jesus closed out and he says, how much more does God, will God give you what you need if you ask, seek, and knock? And what is it that you get? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of the living God. The one who stepped out into the darkness and said, let there be, and there was. The one who gave God's own son to come into the world and to live and manifest what God is like and what we could be like to God. To show us how cruel the world can be, but to affirm for us that love God's love, selfless, sacrificial love is the answer and that there is no darkness that can put out that light, that God, and that's what we get. It might not be what we ask for, but it is our daily bread, day by day by day by day, morning by morning. How much more? Amen. This morning, I'd like you to join me in a participatory prayer. I want a response from you. After I say a prayer or after anyone adds a prayer, I'd like you to say, 
Hear our prayer, O Lord. And Tom, if there are any prayers in the chat room, uh, if you'll let me know a little later. So let us be in prayer. Almighty One, you who know our every thought, our every need, listen to us. Guide us in our requests that we make to you. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Fill us with your spirit to uplift our spirits. Give us courage to be known as your followers, your church. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Give us compassion for your children whose needs we can fill, not only in the world, but in our community, in our church. Those who are ill, who are without houses, who seek justice and fair treatment. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Remind us to turn to you who love us and care for our needs, to share those gifts and the knowledge of your love with people around us. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Are there other prayers? Hear our prayers, O Lord. Tom. Maureen writes, one prayer for my friend, Rod Pittman, who got COVID from an unbeliever and was just recently sick. Um, hear our prayers, O Lord. With grateful hearts, we thank you and praise you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to model for us what being true servants and true believers means. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Amen. Please join in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Mother, Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we will receive our offering, and if our ushers would come forward.
Do we have announcements? Thank you. Any others? Nancy? Oh, Tom. Um, Maureen wrote uh, gratitude to Ecology Center, thoughts on reducing plastic in gardening, and wants us all to know there are TV mud rebate programs for up to $2,000 for converting a lawn and $50 for using gray water to water your And we'll probably have more information about that in our weekly bulletin. So, all right, our closing hymn, New Century Hymnal, number 490. I want to go, I want Jesus to go with me. Let's stand. Oh, uh -huh.
Thank you, God, for being in our midst. We vow to walk with you as we leave this place. Let the seeds of gospel that have been planted into our spirits today be watered with your word, with prayer, with fellowship, and service to the kingdom throughout the week. And may we bear fruit in your name for the good of your people. Let us go into the world walking with Jesus, with justice, and with peace. Give us, Lord, not what we ask for, but what we need. Amen. Go in peace. Have a great week.